Hi, everyone. Uh, so this is IEEE Power and Energy Seminar Series, and we are delighted to welcome uh, Professor Baker from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, she received her BS, MS, and PhD from Carnegie Mellon, and after that uh, worked at the National Renewable Energy Labs uh, for three years. And then since 2017, she has been an assistant professor at CU Boulder and is a fellow of the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute. And uh, today she will be giving a talk titled Hybrid Data Driven and Physics Based Optimal Power Flow. And uh, yeah, we're so happy that you took the time, Professor Baker, and, and take it away from here. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, just to check, is the right screen being shared or is it my, okay. Yes, cool. that is the right screen. All right, so before I get started, I just wanna give a shout out to my research group. Um, we tackle a, a larger, as Keith was just mentioning, a large array of different problems. Um, we have you know, civil engineers, computer scientists, applied mathematicians, electrical engineers. Um, and they really uh, helped inspire a lot of the interesting ideas that I'm going to talk about today. So some of our more traditional topics, we've done a lot with distribution grids, um, smart inverter control, uh, a lot of smart home research. So how can buildings interact with the grid? And then, of course, um, what I've spent the past th three years on at this point, um, the grid optimization competition. So all these things uh, I am not going to be talking about today, but just to give you a, a brief um, overview of a, a lot of the different topics that we've, we've covered. So I'm going to introduce this idea that I've been really passionate about for the past few years, um, which is learning the solution to an optimization problem. So sort of departing from the traditional way of solving optimal power flow very quickly, which you know we can use distributed optimization, we can use linearizations, approximations. Um, but how can we leverage the massive amount of data that grid operators have collected over the past few decades and harness that data to solve this problem faster? So that'll be the first part of the talk. The second part um, is moving away from snapshot optimal power flow. The grid, when grid operators actually solve these problems, is heavily time linked. So it's nice for papers to take a look at snapshot, you know, in a vacuum, AC optimal power flow. But what actually needs to be solved is, um, you know, dealing with storage constraints or generator ramping constraints or other time dependent variables. And then the last part of the talk is after going through, you know, a lot of uh, work in learning solutions to these optimization problems, me and my collaborators realized that everyone in this field was using different data sets to test our algorithms. And so we were basically uh, isolated and not being able to compare our results with each other. So it was unclear which method was actually doing better. So the third part of the talk is our recent paper um, that's talking about how to develop data sets that we can all commonly train on, um, much like the rest of the field of computer science power systems is a little bit uh, lagging behind in terms of reproducibility. Okay, so learning ACOPF solutions. And I'll, I'll, say, I'll say what that acronym means if you've never heard it before. Um, but to take a step back, the power grid is in many cases underappreciated. And I say that as somebody who thinks about the grid every day, but I think the average consumer is also starting to think about, wow, outages are increasing. Um, I can't really rely on the power grid to su supply power during extreme weather, during you know the Texas freeze, for example. But the power grid has significantly improved our lives. And that's why the US National Academy of Engineering ranks power as the number one greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. And this judging criteria was based on how much an achievement improved quality of life. So if we think about the internet, indoor lighting without using fossil fuels, refrigeration of medicine, all these things require electric power. Um, it has significantly changed the way that we look at um, look at life in the United States. So on the bottom left-hand side here are just the large-scale transmission lines in the US, which are 138 kV and above. This doesn't even account for the little, um, uh, what's it called, like arteries or the big ones, and then the really small veins are called uh, capillaries. Yeah, it doesn't the even capillaries. count for the capillaries. Yeah, that are the distribution grids. So these branch off into a, a very, very massive, um, system. 
On the bottom right hand side here, you see a lot of the large scale power plants in the grid. So these are kind of correlated with population centers, although we've been urbanizing um, in the past few decades and a lot of people have been moving more towards the coasts. Certainly in California, I'm sure you know of how <laughs> crowded it is and how challenging it is to import power into your states. 25% of the power in California is imported. Um, and this is getting increasingly challenging. We don't have a ton of people living in the Midwest, but there's a lot of wind resources in the Midwest. So the way that we originally built the grid is not representative of what our needs are now. Um, to top it all off, we have a lot of uh, climate change and extreme weather related effects that are affecting grid reliability. So you have a bunch of aging components. Um, you know, when the grid was built, it, we weren't expecting people in Colorado, for instance, to install air conditioning. Summers didn't used to be this hot. So basically the utility installs switches on the air conditioners so they can turn them off because the grid can't handle that peak demand right now. Um, we're getting transformers failing, catching on fire. We're getting um, trees blowing into poles. We're getting transmission hooks that snap in high winds and spark against the transmission tower and cause the 2018 campfire, the most expensive natural disaster in the world in 2018. Um, and, one of the, and a very deadly one at that. So all these things together, kind of creating the perfect storm for a grid related disaster. So on the left here, we see, you know, just you've probably heard a lot about the, the Texas freeze last year in February, um, but a lot of customers were without power and estimated 700 people died in that freeze. Um, it was a really, really serious failing of infrastructure, basically based on the fact that ERCOT didn't adequately winterize a lot of their infrastructure. Um, we also have, you know, we were just talking about when I started this call, wildfires, um, wildfires impacting power infrastructure, but also power infrastructure causing wildfires. Wind is a big cause of a lot of major power outages. Um, and then you get some unexpected ones like earthquakes, um, heat waves, which strain the, the infrastructure, reduce the amount of capacity that the lines can carry. Generally, the grid is, is stressed out. So we need to figure out a way that um, we can upgrade these components, we can operate it in a more resilient way while pursuing renewable energy. And this is not an easy problem to solve. So we don't think about this a lot, but supply and demand actually has to be balanced on a second by second level. If it's not balanced on a second by second level, we get the system AC frequency deviating from 60 Hertz. So if you've ever seen um, in your house, maybe the AC kicks on and all of a sudden your lights dim, um, that's on a very small scale, a slight imbalance between supply and demand resulting in a dip in uh, the current supply to your, to your lights. So on a large scale, if we get a generator tripping and supply decreasing, then the demand is gonna be higher than the supply and the system frequency is gonna dip. You're gonna get those lights flickering. You're gonna get equipment possibly not being able to run. Conversely, if you get a spike in supply, let's say there's a bunch of wind all of a sudden in the Pacific Northwest and a huge spike in power, you're gonna get the frequency increasing. And when we had a bunch of very, very large power plants that were sort of balancing system frequency naturally through their natural inertia, um, there was a lot of built-in redundancy and ability to manage the frequency in the system. But now that we're moving more towards inverter-based resources like solar panels, batteries, electric vehicles, it's getting harder to balance the frequency in the system. So to recap, large interconnected system, a lot of different aging components, extreme weather, and to top it all off, new inverter-based resources that are making it challenging to, to balance frequency. Okay, so I can't, you know, tackle every single problem with the power grid as one person in, uh, you know, given the average human lifespan. Uh, so what did I think I could help um, out with in this problem? So I like making optimization algorithms. I like making software. I like looking at problems from a systems level perspective. So I thought maybe there's a way to operate these power grids better to help solve some of these operational issues. So just as a quick background about how we currently operate large-scale grids, 
um, a lot of grid operators solve this problem called the optimal power flow problem. So the optimal power flow problem, which most grid operators use an approximation of that called DC optimal power flow, has nothing to do with DC power. It's just a linearization of AC optimal power flow. So we'll solve this problem to minimize the cost to supply electricity to consumers. We'll have some physics that are included in, in this problem. We'll have what's called the power flow equations in the equality constraints here, basically Kirchhoff's law on a large scale. We'll have inequality equation, constraints that are basically ensuring, you know, the lines don't get overheated, the power plants don't produce too much electricity. And the grid operators solve this maybe on a 15 minute or in some cases, five minute time frame. So this is fine. Um, and there's been literally thousands of papers on how to solve this problem of the optimal power flow problem. The core point being, it's really hard to find a solution of a non-convex optimization problem in a reasonable amount of time. So instead, in real operation, when you're op optimizing across 30,000 nodes in a network, most grid operator operators neglect losses or assume all the voltages are the same or linearize a lot of the grid models. Again, the DCOPF uh, assumption. Now, there's a few things wrong with this. The first one, if just we're just talking about cost, this results in billions of dollars of suboptimalities. So we're operating this massive piece of infrastructure on a, in a suboptimal way. Um, this doesn't have to be the case. <laughs> and the second thing, which is more important, is we're actually resulting in a lot of excess emissions. So what happens when we solve this problem in a snapshot every 15 minutes? Well, the next minute, it's already out of date. Those generation solutions are already out of date. So we need to basically balance supply and demand. So we do that with fast ramping generators like gas turbines. So in between the optimal set points, we're getting a lot of heuristic actions that are typically taken by fast ramping gas turbines. So my argument here is we could operate under a high renewable scenario much better if we didn't have to solve this every 15 minutes, if we could instead balance supply and demand every 30 seconds. So what should we do? In an ideal world, 100 years from now, when computational power is hopefully extremely cheap, we could solve the full high fidelity AC optimal power flow model every one second. We could actually economically and cleanly balance supply demand in the most optimal way. Currently, we can't do that. So that's why all these papers focus on distributed techniques, linearizing, better convexifications than currently exist in the literature. All those are very important. The angle I'm taking right here is we're not using enough of the historical data that grid operators have collected. So we use learned uh, operator know-how when these people actually operate the grids, but the algorithms themselves aren't fully using data. So how can we teach the algorithms to harness some of this previous knowledge? So I thought about this a lot. Um, and the core of it is just solving out an optimization problem is hard. So maybe there's some way that we can just not solve an optimization problem. So this is just a simple version of the AC optimal power flow problem right here. You have voltage variables, so complex voltage, so magnitude and angle. You have sines and cosines. You have squared uh, voltage terms that are in an equality constraint. It's just a, it's a messy optimization problem. So how do grid operators currently solve this? So they usually use some kind of Newton Raphson or interior point-based solver. Um, a lot of the existing power system software that grid operators use is dominated by three or four companies in the US. Um, so like PSSE, uh, Power World, those kind of softwares, they all at the core use a similar optimization algorithm. So you need an initial guess. Uh, maybe you solve a DCOPF to get a good warm start for the ACOPF. You send it to the solver. If it didn't work, maybe you use an approximation like DCOPF. Um, you have to do difficult things in the solver. You might have to invert matrices or factorize matrices, tune some parameters. And maybe it doesn't converge, so you have to restart the process. Hopefully, eventually, you get the optimal solution. So we've been doing the same thing for quite a while. Um, and how do we change this paradigm? 
Well, the grid, you know, and there's a few assumptions I'm making here that we're working on. Uh, the grid mostly doesn't change. The grid operators know where all the transmission lines are. They have a model of the grid. So offline, why don't we just test a bunch of different scenarios in our grid model and store what the optimal solution was? So we're not time constrained. We're generating a bunch of different scenarios. We train a neural network. And then in real time, the neural network performs inference, the process of making a prediction. We change the new loads in the system, maybe the load in the next one minute. Uh, the neural network, all it does during inference, there's no matrix inversions, there's no solving an optimization problem. It's just doing function evaluations and multiplications and additions really, really fast, a couple milliseconds. And then it spits out the optimal power flow solution. So we've shifted the computational burden offline in order to speed up the learning online. We're basically learning a mapping from the demand in the system to what the generator should be set at. So no solving an optimization problem during inference. Okay, does this actually work? Sounds a little, little sketchy. Um, so to give you some confidence, there have been multiple different groups that have looked at this problem. So uh, me and my collaborator, Ahmed Zamzam at NREL, uh, tried it on um, relatively small systems. And we saw that uh, we can achieve feasible ACOPF solutions with very, very small uh, gaps in optimality up to 20 times faster than a solver. So we shift the computational burden offline during inference. It's literally solving an ACOPF in a millisecond. Um, other researchers have used it for uh, security constrained OPF, which can have integer variables, very, very challenging, or um, a bunch of different scenarios you have to optimize over. They solve security constrained DC OPF on an 1800 bus network in less than two seconds. This is extremely hard to do with a conventional optimization technique. There's also areas of the feasible region that are really, really close to voltage collapse and really, really close to singular Jacobian matrices. And so there's a technique called HELM, the holomorphic embedded load flow method that I think was popular when I was a grad student, where they basically iterate um, very slowly and achieve, or they're able to pursue the solution to an ACOPF problem by slowly iterating towards it, um, by deforming the feasible region iteratively. So researchers at Carnegie Mellon were able to uh, use machine learning to solve this problem of difficult ACOPF solutions very quickly using machine learning. Why is this powerful? So don't, it's not magic. You know, it is a black box. It looks like magic, but it's just another approximation of the AC power flow equations. We use approximations of these all the time. Um, it's another approximation. The only difference is, is a much better approximation um, than the ones we've traditionally been using. Neural networks are what's called universal function approximators, meaning that they can approximate any function. You have to sometimes expand them to have, you know, um, infinite number of nodes, but they can technically approximate any function um, with very, very high fidelity. So they can represent non-convex complicated relationships between input and output variables, in this case, between system loading and generator set points and voltages. And they're really, really quick to perform inference because as I said, when you move from left to right to make a prediction, you just apply functions or you perform simple calculations like multiplication. So it's an approximation, but it is a damn good one. And I was shocked when I first tried this on a test case of how good it, it actually approximated the solution. Um, when I first tried this, I thought it, it's too challenging to go from loading directly to the solution of a non-convex optimization problem. So maybe instead of doing this, what I can do is I can attempt to emulate the ACOPF solvers themselves, emulate the iterations. So I made a really simple um, one hidden layer, so it's not even deep learning, one hidden layer neural network where I input my current guess to what the solution of the optimization problem is, and it spits out the next step. So you can think about this um, sort of, let's do a very, very simplified example. So let's say you're trying to find the minimum of a function um, and your initial point is right here. If you do like a Newton's method, it'll iteratively you know, take little baby steps until it reaches the minimum. 
So that's essentially what this neural network is doing, except those steps don't require taking gradients or inverting Jacobian matrices or anything computationally burdensome. So I trained a neural network to learn how to step towards the optimal solution. I generated the training data just by using a solver. So I just solved a bunch of OPFs and I stored the iterations and then I trained a neural network to emulate the iterations. Um, that's, all that, that's all that I did. So you can think about this, you know, that newton rapson method, the most popular way of solving power flow um, is what's called a fixed point iteration. So my candidate point X of K plus one is just a function of my previous iteration X of K. The key point though, is the learning based method using the neural network has a much easier to evaluate F. So in newton rapson when you're using it to solve um, an optimization problem, you have to invert that large Hessian matrix. So here you don't have to invert any large matrix matrices. Um, and the key idea is that you know, instead of going from loads to optimal solution, you just learn the baby steps. So how well did this actually do? So this is not a complicated neural network. Again, it's not even deep learning. Um, so how well did it actually perform? So I generated 200 different loading scenarios um, after training the network. This is just the IEEE 30 bus system, but I tested up to a 1300 bus system. So that's the number of nodes in the power network. The black dashed line is the actual out, optimal output of the generators, the actual ACOPF solution. The colored lines are what the neural network produced as its prediction of how the generator should behave. And so you can see that it does a really good job in some cases of predicting the exact optimal solution for that generator. Um, this one uh, up here, I think had the highest error. I'm not exactly sure why, maybe I didn't generate enough training points um, for, I don't know, I'm not sure why, but it still has a pretty small error. And if you solve a DCOPF where there's no losses and no reactive power, the error is actually often much bigger than the error shown um, in the learning, learning boosted method. So just taking, oops, just taking a look at the largest test case, the 1300 case, an average, you know, across 200 loading scenarios, the average um, error in the cost function was around 1%. So this is pretty acceptable for uh, most markets from what I've seen. And then the time it takes to converge. So solving a 1300 bus ACOPF, um, it does take quite a bit of time. Um, the worst case scenario I found was it took 20 seconds to solve this snapshot. OPF on average, it took 7.6 with the solver, the MIP solver. The neural network, the mean time is a third of a second. So it also has a very, very low variance because you know as it's passing through the neural network, it has a very, very consistent amount of time it takes to go through the neural network. So we're seeing speed ups of like 20 times using this thing. Now for the small network, it actually doesn't, uh, it actually takes longer and the reason for that is for the smaller network, using the actual gradients and iterating in the actual uh, direction that you should be iterating um, makes it converge extremely fast. So in the 30 bus, I think it only took like two or three iterations of the newton rapson method to converge. The neural network is taking these sloppy kind of, um, you know, approximate iterations towards the optimal. So it actually takes longer, but scaling this up, it, it was really powerful. So you can actually um, guarantee if you design the weights in the neural net and the biases in the neural network in a certain way, you can guarantee that this thing converges. And so, um, which is really good because then it won't be running forever. So you can see this is just iterations versus how far we are from convergence, the distant, the L2 norm of the um, iteration distance. So the map power solver converges extremely quickly in terms of number of iterations, because it's using exact gradients. Again, it's, it's iterating in the best possible way towards the optimal solution. The learning boosted method takes a long time in terms of iterations, because we're using approximate directions. But who cares about iterations? I mean, I care about time it takes to converge. I don't care about the number of iterations it took. So this is just something interesting to show you that it is approximate. Okay. So 
this neural network is performing regression. Now, regression in this case has no guarantee of satisfying these complicated equality constraints. So what did we do? So when it spits out an answer and it says, okay, I think I've converged to the optimal solution, it's usually a couple percent away from actually satisfying those equality constraints with the tolerance that we want, like one e to the negative four. So what we did was then we send those variables to a power flow solver, which is just a nonlinear equation solver, not an optimization problem, and it nudges it into the feasible region. So you can think about this, you know, again, to use a very simplified example. Here's my non-convex ACOPF feasible region. Maybe my minimums like right here. It, the neural net might pop out a solution that's right here and then sending it to the power flow solver uh, nudges it back into the feasible region. So there will be, so the power flow solver basically um, fixes some of the variables that I give it and then it solves for some of the other variables. So it'll actually make it slightly suboptimal, but uh, it's generally still extremely close to optimal. So I compared this with the industry accepted, accepted standard for optimal power flow. This is how multi-million dollar electricity markets work. They run DC optimal power flow. And I'm shocked that nobody's complained about the inaccuracies because you could make a lot more money depending on where you are um, if they switch to AC. But here I show the average uh, optimality gap. So the distance from the cost function, um, minimizing generation cost from the neural network or DCOPF with the true optimal minimum cost. So just taking a look at the 1300 bus system again, the average optimality gap, the average distance from the cheapest solution is less than a tenth of a percent. So this is pretty, pretty low. Um, on the other hand, using a DCOPF results in 1.4%. So mag order of magnitudes higher error in cost function. So these suboptimal market decisions of which generators get to produce power and how much they get paid is kind of accumulating a bunch of costs, which is where that billion dollars of suboptimalities figure came from, and also emissions. So again, you're going to have these gas turbines uh, being adjusting their output to account for the fluctuations. Um, I'll actually skip this slide. So to show a uh, weirdly balanced radar chart, um, I compared DCOPF, the neural network, and ACOPF. The solve time as compared to the, the true ACOPF, um, you can see that both DCOPF and the neural network have a very small time to converge, which is good. The average optimality gap, on the other hand, uh, DCOPF has a massive op optimality gap. And that's, again, because they neglect losses, reactive power, voltage magnitude. It's kind of crazy that we use DCOPF. Um, and then the last part is, what percentage of the time did the algorithm fail? So ACOPF, if you've ever solved it, you've probably gotten some kind of message that from the solver that's like, couldn't converge, singular Jacobian, blah, 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 something like that. Um, it's a hard problem to solve. That's why people focus so much on it. Um, so the ACO fails quite a bit. The neural network does fail. Um, there are some instances where after it converges, they send that to the power flow solver to nudge it back into feasibility that it's unable to find a feasible solution. So that does happen. Um, and there have just a shout out to some other people in this area. There have been works on embedding the power flow equations in the neural network itself um, out of Carnegie Mellon. Some really interesting papers there. It slows it down, but it still guarantees feasibility. Okay, so what does this allow us to do? Um, it allows us to track optimal solutions in real time. So if we're talking about online optimization or if we're talking about merging control with optimization, um, this tool, and there's a caveat with this, which I'll get to in the next slide, this tool is capable of solving these OPF equations in real time. So if you're doing a normal dispatch, which is the purple line right here with a solver, like map power, um, and yes, my students are using Python now, but I'm not good at Python, and I was doing this myself, so I used MATLAB. Um, it could probably be better if it was in Python. So they solve an OPF here, 
they send the commands to the generators. The generators try to track that those generation commands. And by the time a couple seconds have elapsed, those generation commands are already out of date. So when you have a highly renewable grid, you can get fluctuations at a large scale in, in seconds. Um, so those generation commands are already out of date. Now the learning boosted method is capable of tracking what the optimal solutions should be. You can see there's some error. It's still sloppily tracking in some cases, but it's much, much better than uh, a traditional ACOPF. Now, if you know anything about power systems, you might be thinking, okay, but the power flow equations are steady state equations. If you're starting to use them for dynamics, it doesn't really make sense to send generators commands every one second. You're getting into dynamics now. So that's why my recent work is incorporating those actual generator dynamics into this problem. So we're using something called physics-informed neural networks, which, which are really, really cool. Um, basically, they're able to include the differential equations for like PDEs and ODEs directly in the loss function of the neural network during training. So basically, as you train, you satisfy and you find the solution to those PDEs and ODEs. It's really, really neat. Um, and yeah, I, I won't go too much into how that works. But basically, we want to use pins, as they're called, to incorporate the swing equations, which are um, the simplest form of generator dynamics. But we're combining OPF and the swing equations. And a lot of people have already done this, but we're using a neural network to do it. Um, to incorporate dynamics into determining these optimal set points. So uh, that should be out soon. Um, the prediction accuracy is crazy. Um, it predicts, you know, you can't even see the, the actual swing equation output, but it predicts the output of the generators really, really well. Okay, so I just spent a bunch of time trashing DCOPF, and now I'm gonna talk about a paper we wrote where we <laughs> use DCOPF. Um, and my argument here is that DCOPF is what's actually used by grid operators. So if I have any hope of getting one of these methods implemented in my lifetime, uh, maybe I should start matching what some of the grid operators are doing. So let's take a look at intertemporal constraints. So again, like I was saying in the beginning, you don't really solve OPF in a, in a vacuum. You need to encounter, incorporate time dependency into your optimization problems. One of the simplest ways of doing this is through ramp constraints. So generators, uh, PG is their active power output at time T plus one. Generators can only change their output a certain amount within a certain time frame. You know, coal plants are pretty slow. Nuclear plants in the US are pretty slow. Gas turbines are generally pretty fast. Um, but we want to incorporate these time dependencies into the neural network. We did that through what's called a recurrent neural network that has a natural ability to incorporate um, time dependency between predict uh, predicted variables. Um, one way you can think about this, they don't actually use RNNs for predictive texting, but it's a good example, um, is predictive texting. So basically you start typing and then your phone predicts what word you're going to type out. So similar concept here, the power network sees what's going on and it has a good forecast of what it predicts is gonna happen based on not just current status, but also past, um, past things. So here's an example from California. Um, you know, We generally have this pattern in California throughout the day. We have a dip in the middle that when there's a bunch of solar, we have a peak when people wake up and start using electricity and then a peak when they come home and start using more electricity, because we love using electricity. So there's a natural time dependence that actually most days in California follow. So why don't we use this in the learning model and say, hey, we're at this time step, let's forecast what's gonna happen in the system next using a recurrent neural network. So if you do this for just one scenario, DCOPF, you can solve in less than a second. But what if you actually want to use it for forecasting? What if you want to simulate a bunch of different wind, solar, and demand scenarios as a grid operator to know if you're going to have a capacity issue in a few hours? So in California and Texas, um, had a lot of these in the past couple of years. So using a tool like an RNN, which again, it's, take, it's going to take one second to produce a forecast for the next day, um, can help grid operators 
predict what's going to happen with the generator output. This is not the same thing as forecasting, and I want to make that clear as traditional forecasting. Traditional forecasting isn't constrained. It's not predicting the solution of optimization problems. It's predicting what the output of a wind generator will be or what the demand curve will be. The RNN is predicting how the grid operational algorithm is going to result in which generators or how generators operate. Hopefully that's clear. Um, so the interesting thing with the RNN is that we include not only the error in predictions when we train the neural network, but we also include the constraints of the problem directly into the loss function when we train. So as we're training the, the neural network, we're basically minimizing the constraint violations in the neural network. So this basically pushes the solutions into the feasible space. Um, and so here's a example loss function here might here we might have our opf cost function and then we also have different constraints this is probably um power belt or this could represent power balance constraints this could represent the generator ramping constraints or inequality constraints and you have weights associated with these different constraints when you train so including the constraints directly in there um, helps the RNN produce feasible solutions. So we don't have to have that post-processing step like I showed with the previous method. So what does including those constraints into this method do? So here is uh, the ramping rate for um, just one of the generators in our considered system. Or actually this one's one generator, this one's another generator. Let's look at this generator. So over time, um, if we're just training the neural network based on prediction error, and it's trying to just perform regression to predict what the generator should do, you get deviations where the generator actually violates its ramp limits. This might result in a low prediction error, but what should override accuracy should be feasibility. So this one over here is a neural network we trained by penalizing constraint violations during training. Penalizing the constraint violations, you can see the generator does not ramp outside of its limits. Um, and so including those additional terms helped us produce feasible solutions. Now, an equality constraint, the power balance constraint, um, this one. These are really hard to satisfy with exact uh, precision at zero. So you might get a, a really good um, loss function value during training, you might say like, yeah, I've satisfied my power balance for all the training test points. But then you perform inference and then you notice that there's a bunch of violations where this isn't exactly zero. It's just really, really hard to get that to be exactly zero. Um, so that's, you know, satisfying equality constraints is really hard. Okay, so that's also sort of preliminary incorporating these time dependencies into a recurrent neural network. Now, with all of these that I've talked about today, I basically generated, okay, so just some background. Here's the ACOPF feasible region. When you download like the Python or MATLAB test case for like the 14 bus system or 118 bus system, they give you one loading. They just give you a single load to run the network. So what people do is they're like, oh, I'll take that load that comes with the test case. I'll perturb it plus or minus 10%. And this will be my training set. And so a bunch of us, including me, were like, okay, I'll train and test on these loading scenarios. And of course it performs really well because you're within this convex region of the feasible set. Now imagine if you were trying to train a model to represent every single possible loading scenario. So this is a lot harder. And that's what we decided we need to start pursuing. No grid operator is going to use a machine learning based control strategy unless you can tell them, yes, during a heat wave, we can produce a feasible solution. During a cold front, we can produce a feasible solution. So we needed to change the way we operate or we generate these data points. So do we have confidence? No, I don't even have confidence. And I made I made this up. You know, I don't have confidence in my own work. All the papers use different data sets. All use different ways of generating those data sets. Some use different models or different versions of the models. It's just, it's not reproducible. 
you know, the, the machine learning community would laugh at us if they were comparing us against their very, very high fidelity and, and well-tested data sets that everybody uses in their papers. So we need something like this. So I worked with um, Traeger, who was an undergrad student at NREL at the time. Now he's a PhD student at University of Washington and my colleague Ahmed at NREL to basically take a first pass at how can we generate a data set that represents the entire feasible region? So this is available online um, and kudos to this paper that solved uh, N minus one classification tasks. We got the idea for how to create the data set from, from that paper. Okay, so briefly how the data set creation technique works. So we have our AC feasible region in here, it's non-convex. Um, Again, you know, it's non-convex because I can pick two uh, feasible points. I can connect them with the line and not all the points on the line, that should have been connected. Not all the points on the line lie within the feasible region. Um, we use a second order cone relaxation as an outer approximation. So basically we now have a convex representation that includes the AC feasible region. We then need to start sampling the space to start getting a bunch of uh, loading scenarios. So we generate, a, we find what's called the Chebyshev center, um, which is the minimum radius ball that encapsulates the feasible region. We generate a random direction and we travel a random distance along that direction. Using that new point that we've traveled to, we then test, is this AC feasible? So generating an AC feasible solution is really challenging. Testing if a point is AC feasible is actually not that challenging. So Checking if it's feasible um, is not that challenging. If not, we define something called an infeasibility certificate. So we find the next uh, uh, feasible point to the convex region, which is easier than finding the next feasible point to the non-convex region. We then generate a cut, basically saying, okay, I know everything down here is not gonna be feasible, so just cut this region out. And then we kind of repeat the process. So then we have a much smaller ball that we're taking a look at. We generate the Chebyshev center within the ball. Um, and then we test whether or not these generated points are AC feasible. And so we basically continue doing this. We make these infeasibility cuts. And then eventually we've generated a bunch of points that lie within the AC feasible region and span a lot more of the AC feasible region than just generating a, a, a ball around the base loading point. So how do we know when to stop this method? Um, this was something we debated a lot. How do we know when we found enough solutions that the neural network would be trained on a representative region? So what we did was we decided to look at what's called active sets. So active sets, if you remember from the optimization problem before, you have inequality constraints. So this is a vector here, just writing it as one right now. You have a bunch of inequality constraints. At the optimal solution, some of these equality constraints are what's called binding, where this is a strict equality, meaning that you're right on the edge of the feasible region. Um, in Well, that's not exactly true. You're right on the edge of that particular constraint. So the different types of active sets describe the different regions of the AC feasible region. So you might get some locations where the voltages are at their limit or some locations where the line flows are at their limit. So when we're generating the data, we took a look at how many new active sets are we uncovering as a proxy of how many new regions are we uncovering. And then just to give you an idea of how this compares against what I was talking about before, what everyone was doing, just perturbing the load plus or minus 10%. In this case, um, across the 14 bus network, the five bus network and the 30 bus network, you only get like five different active sets and 13 different active sets. With the OPF learn method, we're getting 10 to the four different active sets. So we basically created a way of spanning a bunch of these little areas in the feasible region to create confidence in, in the machine learning methods. Okay, so how does a model trained with these different data sets perform? So let's first take a look at the typical data set trained model. So just 
creating data per, from pertur perturbations around the base load. So if you test it, if you train and test on a typical uh, data set, it does really well. And this is what we saw in the first part of my talk and in a bunch of papers. You can get extremely good predictions when you're just looking at a tiny little box around the, the optimal solution. However, if you test it on out of sample uh, data points, if you actually test it on other regions of the feasible network, it can have an extremely high error. So we do not want to train a model on a small amount of data and then actually deploy it because it might result in blackouts. This would probably be a blackout. Um, if we look at the OPF learn data set trained model, it's a lot harder to train a neural network to learn solutions in a very complex space. So that's why you're seeing that when we test it on the typical data set, it actually has a higher error than this case. It's because it has to learn a lot more complicated things. So it's not gonna be well-trained in this little region like the other one. However, on a, a wide range of the feasible region, you see that it has a low error, certainly within the realm of um, using a D DCOPF versus an ACOPF. So we've done this for these networks right here. Um, we actually provided the code for you to generate the samples for your own arbitrary network. Um, if you would like to do that, uh, we just didn't have time because it was a summer internship. Um, but this is kind of the push that, that I'm excited about is how do we make these methods more robust and have more confidence in them? Okay, so to conclude, um, and thank you for your, for your time, certainly. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, people complaining about how software people think that they can decarbonize with software. And I argue that there actually is some room to decarbonize with software and we can reduce carbon emissions with a software upgrade. So why not do that? Um, and then the last point I wanna make is that we need a standardized way of comparing the literature because otherwise we're just writing papers in a vacuum and you know never actually gonna have these methods make an impact. So thank you so much. I see that there's a bunch of questions in the chat, um, but I really, really appreciate your attention. That was awesome. That was really great. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording uh, for the question section.